Well, it's good to see you all here this afternoon once again to continue our study in the um, uh, family seasons topic of our lessons for this quarter. And so far we've uh, been doing well. Second lesson, but this coming week will be the third one. And it's just a continuation, I believe, of what we talked about the first time. And today's lesson, choices. And now we're going to carry on preparing for change is the title of uh, the study for today, for this coming week. So before we begin, let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for having been with us this day thus far. We had good service, and uh, we know that your presence was here with us. And now this afternoon, as we open our Bibles again in looking at uh, some of the, uh, the truths uh, that is locked up in your word, may your Holy Spirit open our minds so we can understand these things. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's, it's, it's a surety that, that life is full of changes. Life is full of changes. Things change all the time. Uh, in fact, change is part of our very existence. We, we don't stay small. The changes come as we grow older. We start anything new. As the time goes by, things happen, and there's a change. Everywhere, changes happen. Even uh, the laws of physics that we know should be stable, right? And we can predict things, but even there's changes there many times in the world out there, in the, 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 the planets, and, the, uh, and we're looking at the stars. There's always changes happening. Unpredictable, even though we know physics says this, physics says that, but there are changes anyway that will always come. Often changes come unexpectedly, we know that. You set on a course, everything is fine and routine, and suddenly there's a change. You're sitting in your car, uh, driving to the store, and then you have a flat tire. You didn't plan for it. But it just happens. So there's a change in your, in your mission for that day. So you have to get out, fix the flat, or call a tow truck. You didn't plan on it, but it happened that way. Everything changes. And uh, many times, like I say, we are caught off guard. Then again, we can see changes coming. They're not unexpected. Right? We, we are given forewarnings. We are given signs. We are given indicators that let us know that things are going to be different. We know it's coming. And when these changes happen, it's always wise to start preparing. To start preparing for what we can see is coming. Right. So, uh, like for instance, we know we're going to die. There's a change going to come. And so we need to prepare for that. You know, but sometimes death overtakes us suddenly. Maybe you're in an accident and somebody dies suddenly. But that is why we have to plan. Families have to pre prepare for that eventuality. And even parents will have a plan for that eventuality when it comes. Many of these changes in our lives that will come are big changes. Like um, marriage. That's a big change. You used to be alone. That, now you've got somebody to consider. Right? Then comes children. Whoa. The married couple was okay. They just managed to be together by themselves. I'm understanding her. She's understanding me. Then the first child comes. And that is something. Right? When children come into your life, a big changes happen. For everybody. <laughs> Everybody, right? And there's a, a old, old age. We, that when that comes into the, uh, the, the, the cycle, hey man, old age. You, how do you plan for old age? Well, we're going to talk about that. How, we plan, how, how do we, we plan for old age? Right? This lesson is about preparing, preparing for change, right? And, and even for, uh, like for death, like we already spoke about. We have to prepare for these things, these changes to come. So, as we look at this topic, 
preparing for change. Let, let's start uh, uh, the, the, the lesson in our, in our uh, books were telling us to start at the beginning. Learning from the failures of others. If you don't plan, then you can, you can not complete what you want to do in a, in a proper time and without much, uh, much fuss and, and hurt. So planning is very important. Preparing, but some people did not. And here we want to look at the experience of, of some of the Bible characters. And we usually go to the Bible to see, uh, to look for models, you know. Now, we can look to people but, uh, that are living now, but they're few and far between. But when we go to the scriptures, we can see how these were people that were, that were living for God, that were uh, in, uh, right on the pathway. God had chosen them and they could, could, could see him and so many times hear him, but if they didn't plan and prepare well, how did it go for them? And I'm looking especially at the children of Israel. Remember the children of Israel? And when they were brought out of the land of Egypt? When they came out of the land of Egypt, suddenly hey, they had this enormous change take place in their lives. For hundreds of years, they were in captivity there, and they, they got so used to that lifestyle. And now, when they were being liberated, that was a big change for them. And they were happy. Some were happy. Some, do you think everybody was happy? No. Why not? They were but being free from, from the Egyptian bondage. Why were they not happy? Some of them not happy. No, no. The food, they were looking the food, for onions the and, uh, <laughs> there is the leeks and all of this food that they missed. Okay, okay. So, so yes. Uh, <clears throat> they had a maid in Egypt almost. 400 so, years. Like Benji said, out in the desert, they didn't have a lot of the things they had in Egypt. Okay, okay. Lest we are too quick to, to, to judge them, there's a text in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 10. You know, what, what does it say? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. Lest we get a little too hard on them, what, is it? So what does Paul say to the Corinthians? Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10 says what? For I no. 1 Corinthians. Okay. Verse 10? Yes, 1 Corinthians 10, 10. Neither murmur, yeah, as some of them murmured and perished by the destroyer. Okay, so that's what happened. They were murmuring because they were not happy. Some of them. Sorry? They are not happy. They are murmuring. Some are murmuring. Yes. Some also. Yeah, yeah. Some murmuring. And, and, and when you think of us today, we're not, we're not all, always all the time happy. Not all the, in other words, what he's saying is, they were not all of the same mind. Everybody is saying, oh, here comes the liberation. Let us all go. There were many that were thinking otherwise. Uh, Joe? I, I want to say that... Um, Part of the problem of these uh, Israelites when they came out of Egypt yes. uh, was uh, they had a certain type of life yes. in Egypt. Yes. Yeah, well, I don't know if it was that comfort, but <laughs> because they were slaves. Yes. Yes. But out of it, they, they actually wanted to try to have a comfort life. I, I'm not saying that God didn't want to give them that comfort life. Yes. But they had to uh, uh, go through a process of learning how to live a different life now, yes, that, yes. now that they were free. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the, the reason they were murmuring now, it, it wasn't like, oh, uh, like, oh I, I, I would like to, to go back to, to, uh, to be a slave. Right. No. no. They wanted the, the good things that they had over there, like, like the food. Yes, they yes. consider it was good because in the wilderness, as, as Terry said, they had nothing. Yes. Uh, other people thought that they would could have done better than than Moses. Yes. So the leadership for them, uh, for them, wasn't right. Yes. So and, and God was very specific. If you're murmuring Moses, you're murmuring myself. Correct. Because because I am the one who put him. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that I want to say is. They were not patient. Yes. 
they were not patient. They are not thankful. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so so yeah. they were not thankful, that's right, but they were not patient. They want to see the, the promised land right after crossing the Red Sea. That yeah. was the problem. Yes. Yeah. And there was a long way to go. Yeah. Mm. So so okay, so the bottom line was they were they were not of one mind. Mm -hmm. When when Moses told them the good news, they were not on the same page. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. They were not thinking alike that this is our way out. And in the end, we will be indeed free. Because like you say, Canaan was not too far away from Egypt. It was not that far away. I don't know how quickly they could get there because there were a, a lot of people. But no more than a few months maybe, they would be right there in Canaan. But they didn't get there until 40 years later. 40 years later. Because they were not together. They were not on the same page. And I look at us too, at God's church today, not all of us are on the same page. Let, let's face it. There's a lot of murmurings and, and grumblings going on. We don't like certain things that's happening in the church. I mean, just the local church. We have problems there. Because we are not on one mind. Look, we're all going towards Canaan land. We're going to be in heaven one day. We look at the stuff down here instead of raising our eyes up there and looking at the big picture. That's why God killed all of them except Caleb and uh, Joshua. Uh, Joshua because they were murmurers, they were not uh, thankful. <clears throat> Is that why they were not able to enter the promised land? You know, some commentators tell us that, but God is not. Uh, they, they were just not ready. See, that sometimes it takes a generation or more to meet what God's requirement is make mm -hmm. to make a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really does. because. When you, the parents are up here, the parents are already close to death. But all these young ones come up, these are the changes. They make the changes, these ones that come up. You see? So, so Joshua and Caleb, the faithful ones, with a good report. God said, you will, you will go in. But totally I took Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these two no. brought a good report, right? Yeah. Joshua yeah, they're, they're and they're liars. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, well, they were not liars, but they were just not looking at what they should be looking at. The positive things. Yeah. They were looking at more at all the harmful stuff, you know. They said there's giants there. Yeah. We like little grasshoppers there. Can, can, can we say <laughs> that, that uh, God killed them because they were forgetful? No. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they but, forgot. Um, came from and the wonders that God did yeah. in order to, to free them. Yes. And, and now when they face the, 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 the obstacle, they say, ah, oh, we can't. Mm. Was, it, was it even uh, harder to come out of Egypt? Yeah. Yes, it, it, it was. But they forgot. Hold on. Okay, and, and, and then, of, and then uh, yes? Came out of Egypt, yes. they committed a lot of uh, no-no's. Yeah, yeah. They worshipped the golden image. Yes. Mm -hmm. They murmured against Moses. Murmured yes, against but, Moses and yes, but it's Egyptian. The wife also Egyptian. The intermarriage are the friends. <coughs> so that's why the, the wife acquired to the, the wife is all Hebrew and married to the Egyptian. So she imitated the life of the husband because he's an Egyptian. There, there is an intermarriage at the time uh, with the bandits of the group of people, is right? There is a uh, intermarriage of relation, uh, marriage for the Egyptian and the Hebrew. <coughs> so that was why they will be also, they are different uh, understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There is divided. On top, what, and, you, and you're right there. On top of that, the yes. four, they needed the 40 years Yes. Stay in, in the wilderness in yes. order to make their bodies yeah. stronger okay. and able to fight their enemies. Yeah. Because the enemies have high walls yeah. and big people, giants. Yeah. The Israel, the Israeli was only four feet, eight, okay. or <laughs> five feet. Yeah, I don't know the exact the height and so, but I do know, uh, uh, Benji, the bottom line was they were not faithful. They didn't trust yeah, God. Yes. They, they, they went, right. yeah, they went back and back, right? Right. And, and you had a statement. Job, uh, Job said, all through the after they came out of, it, out of Egypt, if you look all through the Old Testament, God keeps reminding them, I am the God of yeah. Jacob. 
of Abraham that brought you out of the great hand that brought you out of Israel. Yeah. And he says that an awful lot yes. to the whole Old Testament. And they were and, and but, yeah. but but the bottom line is, and you're right, they were not they were not faithful. Not they, they said no. No. Now again, we have to stop every time because we are Israel walking to Canaan. We, the present, God's present people. Are we any different? That we have to ask the question. Are we, we may not be murmuring out like they were in, in, in big amounts, but are we uh, satisfied with what we have and are we of one mind? Are we thinking of the prize it in front of us? Mm. So don't let's be too hard on them because sometimes we are not too far off as well. But let's move on. We need to find another example. Moses was prevented from getting the Canaan. Yeah, because he, he could see it. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, yes. Moses, uh, in, you know, at the time of murmuring of the people, the bandits of yes, yes. the already in the, in the already 40 years in the yes, wilderness. wilderness uh -huh. So these people, people are, they are not people and also are also people. Uh, they are also oh. thankful and also, they are also not thankful. But you know, God decided that to kill them at that time. Yeah. But my, Moses is a man of decision. Yeah. He said, "If you want to kill them, you just kill me." Uh -huh. Because <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. what shall be the people around the Amorites? We are getting the people in the Egypt, yeah. and then in the wilderness, you will kill them. Yeah. And so God changed his mind okay. because he he obeyed Moses. Yeah. yeah. There is a there is also a. A fighting with each other. Yeah. Okay, Moses, Moses, okay, I changed my mind. Yeah, okay. Those people are murmuring. The age of 20, yeah. 20, uh, the 20, uh, going down, mm -hmm. uh, no, 20 up, yeah. they will not yeah. come to the Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. But the younger, the younger one, will be uh, going to the Kingdom. Okay, now, now, okay, you hold your thought there. Yeah. Because we, we are looking at, at learning from the failures of these. So we can learn from the Israel experience, no matter what, from Moses, uh, Joshua and Caleb, and, and those that could not go in. So we have to learn from that, right? Another, another uh, uh, thing that we could look at, another person, uh, in Matthew chapter 26, we read about Peter. What, what was it that, that we can learn from Peter Peter's experience. Matthew 26, 31 to 35. What, what does it say there? Matthew 26, 31 to 35. What is it talking about? Somebody want to read that? 31 to 35. You know this experience very well. Yes? 31 to 35. Yes? Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended in yes. me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock, yes. shall be scattered abroad. But after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. But yes. Peter answered and said unto him, If all shall be offended in thee, I will never be offended. Jesus yes. said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Even if I must die with thee, yet yes. will I not deny thee? Likewise also <clears throat> said all the disciples. I, he was very quick. Don't yes. be quick to make hasty promise. He said, there was another place when Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. <laughs> he, that's what he said. Same, he always impulsive. And sometimes we say things, or we come to Christ and we, we're not really sure that we want to, but, well, I'll take a chance. I'll go. Well, it didn't work out for Peter. He, 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 he says, I, I will not forsake you, Lord. Me, forsake you? Never. I won't do that. Yeah. And yet, what did he do? Yeah. Right? He forsook him. We know what happened. There was another story about Ananias and Sapphira. We don't have to read that, but we know exactly what happened to them. That's also a, 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 a learning of failure. Making a promise to God. And they're not keeping the promise. And some of us think that it, God was very harsh. Why, why kill them for just withholding something? At least they brought, they brought a money that they sold the land for. It just wasn't everything. They held a little back for themselves. And they were struck dead. So what? why was God so harsh on them? 
Why is God so harsh on them? God was not uh, harsh on them. Okay. What? <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that, yes. as the story goes, they sold the land, yes. gave the money, yes. but part of it they kept. Yes. But in their mind, yeah. it kept troubling them. Okay. So that made the heart rate go up. <laughs> Blood pressure went up. <laughs> okay. And they had a stroke or heart attack. Because they were guilty. They felt guilty over what they did. Okay. So the lesson there, uh, Benji, I, I guess the lesson is that, that when we make a promise to God that we will give or we will do, and it could be anything. In this, this case, it was land, like money. But many times, in, in our time, you know, we've got all these talents, but yet we cheat God and rob Him. And we think it's nothing because He is God. He's not going to worry about me being a little haphazard with this or that. But we should learn from these, these stories that God is very particular. When, when, when we say we'll do something, we should try to fulfill that in our lives. You know, not only with our funds. And I know many times we, we, we uh, and I'm just saying this out loud, we promise God a certain amount of money, or let's say, let's say our, our uh, tithe. And I've heard people tell me, you know, I didn't have all my tithe this week, but next week I will double up. Or I won't be able to give this week. I, I, I really have to cover this debt. And God will understand. You know, that's what people are, so they rationalize. But is, 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 is God happy with that? No. Yeah, yeah here's, a, here's a story. The, these two, they did that, and, and in the end, uh, the prophet had to tell them, you were lying to the, to the Holy Spirit. You weren't, you weren't just doing something there that you thought the church wouldn't mind. You were lying to the Holy Spirit by saying that this is it. This is all of what we had, we bring in, and they didn't bring all. So we've got to move on. So why, why, why is it so important that we learn from the failures of others? People fail. Why is it important that we learn from them, from their failures? Learn from him to fall in the same trap. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, we can repeat it. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 God, and God says, open your eyes. <coughs> Look at the lives of people who have stepped out and done things that was not right. Don't you do the same thing. Learn from it. Learn from it. That's what he's trying to say. You know, the examples in the Bible were written for our learning. We know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, the things that are written in the scriptures... It's for our learning. So, and we should take note of that. You know, and not just gloss over, oh, that was another nice story or another bad story, but what is it telling me? Uh, Dr. James Dukan says that uh, when the Bible presents a, a particular thing for yes. the first time, yes. you have to pay attention to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, uh, the, the first time that uh, wine and the effects appear in the Bible, like, like when Noah got drunk, yes. he says, we have to pay attention to that. Because yes. the Bible is presenting something mm -hmm. that is not that good and it's putting it there so we can learn yes. from it. And the other thing is, uh, all these stories are in the Bible for a purpose. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and according to Pastor Glenn, we have heard him saying this uh, a few times, if there is details on this, it's because we have to pay attention to that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the, the reason uh, these stories and failures are there is for us to learn. Exactly right. Yeah. And we do not close our minds to it. We should, we should look at it and say, I, I, I should do better. Yeah. I, I'm not going to do that. So yeah, it's for our learning, so we may avoid the traps and the pitfalls mm. that, uh, that these people fell into. So, continuing now on, uh, we talk about preparing, uh, preparing for change. The next thing we want to look at is preparing for marriage. One, one of, the, of, the, of the, the, the greatest changes in a person's life, we just said so before we, uh, at the beginning of our presentation, is uh, in, a, in a person's life is when he or she gets married. It's one of the biggest changes. And of course, uh, uh, not everyone gets married, we know that. I mean, Jesus didn't marry, and a number of other people other Folks in the Bible didn't get married, but there are big changes that happen in a person's life when they are married. And so now you used to be by yourself, like we said. Now you've got somebody in the house with you. Uh, they may not 
like the same food you like. You used to eat anything before when you were a bachelor or when you were by yourself. Now you have somebody there that don't like tomatoes. You love tomatoes. So, so it's, it, it's, very, it's very hard now. She, food is made and there's tomatoes in there. So you put them all to one side on the plate and your spouse is thinking, what, 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 what's wrong? Didn't I make a good dish? No, you did, but tomatoes, are, it's good for you. And then they may even start an argument. She wants you to eat healthy and you don't want to eat healthy because you don't like tomatoes or you don't like carrots or something. Marriage is a big challenge. It's a big change in your life. You used to go, you used to have your own friends. Now you've got her and her friends. And, and, and many times you don't like her friends <laughs> very much, right? Or she doesn't like your friends. So it's a, it's a, it's a big change. Now, in, incidentally, the first social arrangement in the Bible, and Pastor Glenn talked about that this morning, the first social arrangement was marriage, right? He invented it. He brought the women together there. He told uh, Adam and Eve in the garden uh, something uh, that he was very express about. And he, that wasn't his line of, of what he wanted to bring out in his lesson this morning. But in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, if you go there, you'll see what, Jesus said, what God said. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. What, what did he say to Adam when he brought the woman to him? He stopped right this morning there, remember, after he read that part? Flesh of my flesh. But then in 24, he said something. We need to take note. What did he say? Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. The wife or the husband they shall leave their family. Now you're no longer living with your family. Your, your, you must live with your wife, your spouse, or your husband, and you become one family yourselves. In other words, what he was saying is the relationship is between them two, the two. And many times people say, when you get married to a lady, you're not marrying her alone. You marry that whole family. Or, 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 when, she, or when she marries her husband, she marries into that whole family, right? We, sometimes we, we think that way. Filipino culture, that is very You'd marry the whole everybody. Yeah, I married the Philippines. <laughs> but well, even well, even so, you know, uh, uh, even the relationship is, is between the two of them, and and that's why God said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. In other words, you leave the home, and you be joined to a, to the wife, and they shall become one flesh. So even more, the two of them get together, even more than between them and their parents. Because sometimes, and you hear people say that all the time, my husband always runs to his parents. When we have an argument, then he goes over there, then he talks, then he goes to them, he talks to them, and they talk to him. And then maybe the husband says the wife is always running to the parents. And then the parents want to get into the affairs of these two who are married. You know about those things, right? When, when the mother, the son will always, then the mother will say, my, my son will always be, he's married to her, but he's always be, he'll be my son always. And the, and the other party say, my daughter's married to him, but he will always be my daughter and I will look out for her. Well, he's not only looking out for her, he's fighting for her. He will, he will, he will tell the, boy, the husband, how to run his house and how to treat his daughter. That could be trouble. Exactly. Yeah. And so that is why it's in scripture. It's biblical. It's right here. The husband shall leave his family and cleave to his wife. That's excellent advice right there. Right there. Excellent advice. So the question is, why, do you, why, why is marriage so important to God? Why, why? Only way human beings will be able to populate the earth, mm -hmm. and the whole duty of man is to praise God and give glory to Him. Okay. Mm. That well. is uh, in the Old Testament. Okay. 
And that could be one reason? Just the whole duty of man. Okay, and that could be one reason? Somebody it's, else has? It's, it's a picture more, I think, of uh, us married to Christ, that like church married to, okay. dedicated to, to God. Okay, we're getting closer to what we, the answer we're looking for, not that Benji was totally wrong, but that's what, Pastor? Yeah, uh, I, I, I follow on this uh, thought of Terry. Uh, Men and women mm. are supposed to uh, blend together. Yes. Mm. Right? And like the lesson is, is trying to teach us preparing for marriage, which is a big change. That's right. And whoever in, in, in the marriage, any of, of, of both uh, men and women, if they don't change yes. in, in the state of marriage, yes. something is wrong. Exactly. Something is wrong yeah. because they are to complement each other. That's right. If, if, if I if I want to get married, but I want to stay the same and living my life exactly the same, yes. Then I, I'm not understanding what the marriage is. Yes. So in the marriage, I learn how to love a strange one. Yes. Because I know her for two years, six months, uh, a year, probably a long a longer time, but now she's gonna live with me. Mm. Yes. And, and I and I had I have to learn how to love her, mm. and, and then I, I I learned. To me, the the, 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 the greatest school about I mean the, the greatest lesson about God's love I, I have learned mm -hmm. in, in my in my home, in the my marriage. kids, in my yeah. wife. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I know better God. I know God better because of them. Yeah. So, so that's why I think it is, marriage is important for God. Absolutely right, and that's and that's another good reason. We got, I got one more reason. Yeah, it typifies the relationship between Jesus, His Son, and the Church is mm -hmm. the right of Jesus. Okay, and that's really the, the bottom line answer. The marriage typifies the relationship that exists between God's Son and the Church, His Bride. So. You've noticed that? That, that is the, the, the marriage relationship. Ultimately, the bridegroom will return for his bride in the end. Right? Remember we talked about that before. The bridegroom is preparing a home for the bride. His church. And when he's ready, when things are over, he'll come and say, now I'm going to take you home. See, the marriage motif is always there. Now, another question as we move along is why are some essential preparation, sorry, what are some essential preparations for a healthy marriage? Something, some, some essential uh, 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 preparations. What do you think? Get to know your wife before you marry her. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good start. <laughs> How come? Well, the, and, 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 and you eat. When it comes to blind date. And, 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 and it's right. In a biblical speaking, yeah. we, because a lot of managers, you don't, we don't really, today if we don't uh, have our sons and our daughters, uh, and we don't tell them what to look for in a wife or a husband, then they, they don't mind marrying somebody just that they like. You see? But, 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 uh, but, but first of all, first of all, we have to... Uh, prepare ourselves, Pre preparation for marriage must begin with us personally. The day we decide to get married, or your young man or young lady, it, they must personally prepare. So what do we mean by that? How can they personally prepare and be sure that they want to be married for a start? There is that, you, you have to look at it. In other words, we have to help them pray about this matter of marriage. Because it's a serious thing. You know, marriage, like he was saying, it's a covenant. It's not just a contract, in biblical speaking. So you're going to marry this person for life, right? You're not planning for two, three years, and then up to another one, two, three years. No, you take for life. So you have to look at yourself. Am I capable of doing that now? Am I ready? Many times. The, the husband-to-be or the wife-to-be, they are still in college. They decide to get married. So, so now there's problems. Because they, maybe both of them are going to school, but they are married. How, how, how is that marriage going to work? 
Maybe they've got jobs after school, and the husband works at night, and the wife works in, in the days. They're like two ships passing in the night. They never see each other properly. <laughs> when he comes home to sleep, she goes out to work. So you must, it, it, personally, are you ready? Are you ready? Then the Bible has several things that we have to look at. Is she a good compliment for us? We must look carefully at our future spouse to see if he or she is a good compliment. And then in Proverbs, there's, a, there's these different texts. I don't know if I've got them on your handout, the different texts. Did I give you some texts? To what to look for. If you have a pen or paper, you can write them down. First of all, and these are just some of them, when you're looking for a wife, if you have a pen, make sure, or a husband, make sure he's a hard worker. Proverbs chapter 24 Verse 30 will tell you that. Make sure your spouse is going to be... When they say hard worker, they don't mean pick up heavy weights. You know what I mean? And big steel and carry around. But it means, is the person not afraid to work, to do things? You know, in your house, it's work. You have to work in your house. You've got to work in your yard. Is that person a worker? Uh, they're not scared of, of, of doing hard jobs. You know, not only for others, but for yourself, for your, in your own home. Proverbs 24 verse 30 tells us that. The second thing that this person has listed down here, Proverbs 22 verse 24, if the person is angry all the time, is it an angry person? You, how do you discover if they're angry? How do you know? Will you know? Yeah, and <laughs> make her angry. But will, will, isn't that something that you will know? If you are courting, you at least do things together. Is this person angry all the time? When you take her out to dinner or something, and then a beautiful time spent, and then she comes home and very angry because they didn't serve potatoes with the main course. <laughs> but sometimes the dating game, if we all go on through this, the dating game could be a game. You bring that out. You know what I mean, Joe? I, I, you know, you date and you're, you're always on your best behavior when yeah, you yeah, date, yeah. so it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a game you play. You yeah, know? but the thing is, it's very important to well, know. I understand that. Yeah, it, it's important to know. And the wise man, Proverbs says, make sure that the person is not an angry person, meaning they're angry all the time, any little thing that happens, the person just fly off the handle. You know, and you've seen it, and I've seen it many times, young people married, but arguing over little things. Just get angry over something very small, not calm, and, and, and you can collect it. You try to look for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. it's, it's impossible. But sometimes love is so blind. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're starting with how old? 18 years yeah. old. You know what I mean? He sees a pretty face. Well, he don't care. He just likes that pretty face. Well, that's that's why we've got all these things in scripture that tell us how to seek somebody that can compliment you. Mm -hmm. So don't take somebody so totally uh, opposite you and you hope for the best. I will. They always say, I will change her. I will change him. No. They, they're individual people. It's hard to change somebody that's been set. We just talked about the children of Israel. It's very hard. It's not easy. The third thing, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 and 15 tells us something. And if you wanted to jot down, you could. And we could read it also. But it simply says, do they share your beliefs? That's a very important one. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Does the person share your beliefs? Now that's very important. Somebody asked me at the school today, can you marry a non-adventist? Well, in our class we also had a little discussion this morning. And with the well, what what were the affairs that Joel can tell about? You have an answer. Yeah, do not be equally yoked with unbelievers. But you know, I I was an Adventist, my husband was, I mean, is, still, but 
I just can break it to Seventh-day Adventist. So sometimes it works well like that, even if you're not in the same faith. But the advice in the Bible, as much as possible, you sh should not yeah. be unequally yoked with unbelievers because it's hard. Most of the time, yeah. in general, it's hard to convert it's them. In general, okay. yes. Good yeah. advice. Yeah, and, and there's exceptions, like in your marriage, he doesn't stand in your way if you go to church or do anything like that, right? Yeah, no. So, so there are exceptions, but it's, it's always wiser not to take and hope for the best, that he will, he will come over. And he promises you and your family, oh yes, I will. And many of them even get baptized, just to be able to marry the girl. But when they in, they didn't bapt can become baptized with their full heart. It's just to make sure that the church accepts them, the family accepts them, so he can have the girl, or the girl can have the guy. It goes both ways. And then when they in, it, it doesn't really usually last long. But it's wiser, would you say, to, 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 to try and get somebody that is, is on the same level as you, the faith, the same faith, the same beliefs, at least. First of all, the text doesn't refer to a marriage. Okay. okay. <laughs> the text refers to, to doing business with a person that do, doesn't share what we believe. But uh, yeah, we have applied it uh, for many years to marriage. Yeah. yeah. I want to say this. In my own experience, uh, becoming a pastor, I had no choice. Yes. I mean, in, 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 in the, if it was a non believer or a believer. Yes, yes. Uh, it has to be a seven day after, right? Mm. Yes. So the choice was this one or that one, right? Yes. Those were the choices. Mm. In, 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 and I am in a position now talking about what uh, Terry said. Terry said my, yeah. my son is, he just turned 19. Yes. And, and the other day he told me, I like this girl, mm. she is a seven day after. Yes. But also I like that one, and she's not a seven day after. Yes. Mm. So what, what should I say? Go for this one, that, that is a seven day Adventist. I'm not going to tell him, but I have told him and, her, and my daughter as well. Yes. Do your best in getting, uh, in, in finding someone who shares the same beliefs. But the problem with that is uh, many times, uh, as, as Pastor was mentioning some uh, statistics today, uh, the, the, the numbers of uh, divorce and, and, and those failures in, in, uh, in our own church yes. are kind of high. Yes. And, and we're struggling with that. And many times uh, those marriages who are mixed because uh, this is a non this and this other this they, they stay, stay together longer right. time. Right, right. And, and, we, and we wonder why. But it happens that the, the, the non-believer is is trying to uh, keep the 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 um, the balance in the marriage. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's the idea. No. I'm, I'm just saying what is happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, otherwise, uh, marriage will be destroyed a long time ago. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, um, this is uh, of course the, the the choice number one should be sharing the same beliefs. Right. Yeah. But it shouldn't be. The, the it shouldn't be the only choice. The only choice. No. It shouldn't be the only yeah. choice. Because be. God is going to put in front of us the, the person who is right. Yes. It could be seven day. I don't, it, could, it probably is not. Yes. And, 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 and God has his own plans. And, and he will know what will be the best for us. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I yeah. want to say, I, I know many couples, they, they decided to go with people that believe the same as them, yes. they're not in the church today, so what, what happened? And that's true. So, so there are exceptions. And, and you'll get the feel for it when you bring God into the equation. Yes, you have that, to bring that, God that, into the that, equation. That's the key. Yes. That's the key. When yes. you bring God into the equation and, and ask Him, I'm, I'm looking for a mate as you know, and He knows you're looking, yeah. and say, I have this person, and you pray and ask Him sincerely. The Holy Spirit will direct you and give you guidance, you know. So even if it is a non-Adventist, it's okay. It may, it may be a good family. It may be, my uh, late wife was not an Adventist either. But fortunately, I had to, she, she became one just before we got married, and I didn't coerce her in any way. They were good uh, Sunday-keeping people. Good. That's Sunday. 
And I never preached to her. She knew my religion inside out. So there was no problem there. And I never told her, you better get baptized because otherwise we're not getting married. She's just out of her own. Out of her own. She, she, and she knew she happened to know the pastor of my church. So she contacted him on her own. You know? And, and that's how the Lord worked because prayer brings changes in the life. So you can, you can I personally think if the person's background is good and uh, of reputation, and the next one brings in the family, it says, what does my family say or feel? Proverbs 11 verse 14. We have to consult our family. What do they think? Is that something that we can, can put into the equation? Speaking to family? What do they think? Like your son was telling you. The family got involved. Dad, what about? Uh, and and, the, and your, your rapport with your kids has to be that they can come to you in that situation and say, I'm, I'm, I, I, I like this one or that one. What do you think? So, so Proverbs chapter 11 verse 14 says, bring family, consult, consult. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, uh, the, another one, uh, uh, found in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Uh, uh, am I, I must be sure. Am I, re, am I relying on faith or feelings? Mm -hmm. I must be sure. Am I relying only on feelings or what I can see? Or am I relying on faith? Take, take, take God by faith. If God points to, to a person that this ought to be the person that you should go. Or you just throw all that out and say, I just go with what I want to do. And we've seen many Bible stories like that. that in the scripture, Samson and others who just went across the line and the parents said, no, don't marry that person from there because you know. He said, no, I want her. Just get her for me. You know? And look how we had to, what he had to grow, go through and endure. See? So preparation for marriage is important. And we could even... Uh, I was going to ask you another question. Uh, what, what are the benefits of asking a couple with a healthy marriage uh, to become your mentor? If, you, if you're married and you're asking, you see a model family in the church perhaps, uh, you can talk to them and say, would, could they mentor you in some way? Like, like they have talks with us. You go visit their home. They come to your house and put you on the path, keep you on the path all the time. Because some, somehow, sometimes when we get married, we're on our own. You know what I mean? We just get married, off we go. And now when we are bombarded with all these changes, sometimes we become, we become frustrated. We become frustrated and we want to just walk out or run to mama, you know, or stay overnight at, uh, at my mother's place. You see, all those things happen. And that's not good for the marriage. It doesn't keep the marriage solid, strong. All right, so what about uh, preparing for parenting? Oh. Few things. Few things can change our lives <laughs> than, than the birth of a child. Oh boy. Nothing in the family can or will ever be the same when these people arrive. <laughs> right? As soon as now. Yeah, you've got already a battle on your hands. You want to have a smooth marriage and then these people show up. A, a child comes into the family. Wow. And mind you, these people don't come with an owner's manual. <laughs> These people don't come with an owner's manual. When a baby comes into your life, it's like, whoa, what? You're, you're all thumbs and fingers. You don't know what to do. <laughs> and sometimes parents are, are just stumped, you know, of what to do. When they start growing up, they're stumped about their actions. Why does this child act like that? You know, and there's no two children that are alike. No two kids are alike, you know. Then uh, the, the words they use is when they grow a little older. Now they're in your family. You, parents just don't know what to do. Their attitudes are not right. Uh, and the mothers are going to pull their hair out. What's wrong with this child? Every time I tell them this and that, yeah, there they are. Children arrived. Now what do you do? How do you prepare for that? So what le lessons can we learn from scriptures again? Uh, we know of a, of a, of a situation. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 8. Let's go there before I tell you who the person is. I think maybe I put it in, in the handout. 1 First, First Samuel 1, verse 8. What does it tell us? Uh, 1 
First Samuel 1 verse 8. Hannah, her husband said unto her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am I, am not I better to thee than ten sons? Can you, can you, okay, can you read, read more up to verse 11. Uh, okay. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after yes. they had dr drunk. Now, I, Eli the priest was sitting upon his seat by the doorpost of the temple of Jehovah. Yes. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed yes. to Jehovah and wept sore. Yeah. And she bowed a bow and said, O Jehovah of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but wilt give unto thy handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto Jehovah all the days of his life, and yeah. there shall no razor come upon his head. Yeah, and if you read the next verses, with 20 to 28, you see all the stipulation that was given of how, what, what she should do, and how she should prepare, and things like that for the yes. child. So, well, firstly, what she did, she did the right thing, right? She prayed for a child. She prayed to God for a child. She couldn't have a child. And, uh, and in those days, of course, uh, Elkanah had uh, two wives. The other lady had the children. She didn't have children, and yet he favored her. He wanted them to have a family of their own, but she didn't, and then she prayed for a child. So, so that's, a, that's a good start, right? When a marriage is there, no children, they're starting out, pray to God. Say, Lord, is it it's your will that can I have a child? Uh, talking about preparing for parenting. Yes. Uh, do, the Bible doesn't say but Do we think that uh, Hannah stopped Praying after she got the, the child. Before she got the child. No, I, I, the, the question is: Do we think that she stopped praying after? Oh, that's your question. The, oh, I thought I, I thought it. Yeah. yeah, I don't think so. I think she kept praying, and she made a promise to God. She she said to God, "If I you give me this child, I will give him back to you." Yeah. So God saw her heart. Her heart was was on the right place. So so the the, the reason I ask you this is because yes. Parenting uh, doesn't end uh, at a certain age. No. It seems that it's forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the thing is, uh, many times uh, parents, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm doing the, the yeah. perfect because I have many fellows with my kids, but uh, many, many parents are, they, they stop parenting. Right. They stop parenting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they do what the kids want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't think that's right. That's no, no, no. Yeah. So so when we're preparing for parenting, we keep preparing for parenting. Yes. Yes. Because because that that task doesn't stop. Yeah. No, no, that's true. And and the children will sense that. I mean, even though they're older, even if they're married, you're not interfering in the marriage. But when they come to you with a problem, you're ready. You know. I still get calls from Jason and my son in Florida in the middle of the night. Like Jason, has, he calls me up. He said, Dad, you know, I've got to speak to the, the, the do you know the, the text? Where, where do I find those? Numbers? I said, OK, you give me, I'll call you back. In the middle of the night, you know, they still, uh, they, and then when he has a problem or two on, on certain issues, he, we talk about it. We discuss about it. I tell him, this is what I would do. But finally, it's you in your way of life. You know, he's a doctor. And he meets many people and he has to make decisions many times on these things, you know. But yeah, you're right. Parents will always be parents, you know. As long as we don't interfere, yes. we've got to keep parenting. You're right, you know, because they still look to us. You know, they still look to us because now the grandkids come. Mm -hmm. It's their children, but it's our grandkids. Yes. We share this thing. It's their children. It's our grandkids. We have a right to them, right? And so we, we, we stay parenting. We stay parenting. You, you absolutely. And here was, was Hannah. And God blessed her. She prayed for the child. And then she vowed to exercise to the clean living. Because that's very important. When you prepare for a child, for a child to come into the world, the mother knows that. She has to live cleanly. Because she is bringing a child into the world that depends on her during those times that the child is still unborn, right? And, and um, I, I put this quote in here from Ellen White, and it, I mean, it, uh, it was so poignant. It says uh, on page 256 of uh, Adventist Home, even before the birth of a child, even before the birth of a child, 
the preparation should begin that will enable it to fight successfully the battle against evil. Wow! You would think you would say, because the child has to be strong and healthy. No, no, no. Mm. The, the stride, if you eat right and well and abstain from certain things, the child will be strong and healthy. But more importantly, that you be able to fight successfully the battle against evil. If before the birth of her child she is self-indulgent, if she is selfish, impatient, and exacting, these traits will be reflected in the disposition of the child. Wow, I didn't realize that. Huh? And she, exacting, Ellen White always used words, you know. She's, she's great at using good vocabulary. Do you know what that word exacting is? If the mother is impatient and exacting, what does that mean? Exacting. Do you think? <laughs> well, now I looked it up, you know, right? So nobody can go to a dictionary. No? The word exacting means very demanding, very precise, very, uh, you know, uh, it, my way or the highway. That attitude. And so, if that's part of who she is, if she's selfish, impatient, self-indulgent, those things will be displayed in the kid when he's born. I didn't know that. And here comes the, the clincher. I under, did I underline in your... In your? Mm -hmm. Thus, oh, this is good. Thus, many children have received as a birthright almost unconquerable tendencies to evil. I looked again, I said, I've got to read this again. And that's why I underlined it. I never thought that, that it's so important for the mother to, to, to really, while the child is not born yet, to prepare. Otherwise the child has, will have as a birthright unconquerable tendencies to evil. In other words, when he grows up, It'll be harder for him or her to, to stay, stay away from temptations and to heal to temptation. It'll be hard because of what happened in the mother's womb. Whoa! I'm telling you, it, preparing for, for parenting is not an easy thing. It's not easy. But God, that's what God wants. As, as uh, Glenn was talking this morning, how God sculpted these two with his own hands. Wow. He, 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 his own image is there. You know, it's, it, he made little gods. He made, in my mind, I, made, I mean, I have a small mind. But my mind said to me, God making God. God making his cho own children. They have to be gods. And that's what you call kids that are yours, right? It's your image. It's your kids. And yeah, God is forming. <laughs> Then breathing his own breath. He didn't borrow it or anything like that. Or tickle their toes and say, Adam, get up. He laid onto Adam and blew in his. Oh. So I can see that perfectly well. When, when you look at those two things, you can see what it means. So there are one, uh, another one, one more example. What lesson can we learn from the mistakes of Jacob as a parent? Jacob as a parent, Genesis chapter 37. Let's see what we can learn from Jacob in the line of parenting. Genesis chapter 37. Who has that? Genesis 37. And we read verse 3 and 4. What it says, I'll read it for you. Now, Israel loved Joseph. Israel is just Jacob loved jo Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of, the, of uh, his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So what's going on here? Jacob has favorites. He was a thief. Yeah. He, he has favorites. Giving preferential treatment to one child 
and not the others. Do we do that? Have you done that? Have you done that? I mean, if you're honest, <laughs> just look back. Yeah. <laughs> Did you treat one a little better than the other? Maybe not if you have one or two kids. But I'm thinking of the families where there's eight, nine kids in a, in a home. And, you know, you can see who the favorites are. You can see who the mother favors. You can see who the dad favors. Right? Exactly. That is not parenting properly. There should be an equality in the home. And, and especially when there are weaker kids. You know, all children are not the same. Maybe there's a slower one or two. That, that, that learning at school takes a little harder for them. Maybe uh, some of them, maybe like we, this new term now that we have autistic and all these things. In, in our day when we grew up, we didn't, those words were not available. <laughs> but, but now we've got all these ADH, a, a this and uh, autistic and this one, and, and we die, uh, uh, say, lexic, uh, right? This lexic and all those things. Back when we grew up, we were just kids. If you were slow, you're slow. The others run faster, you come on behind, <laughs> you know? But today, we see how sometimes parents do that. The one that is sharper, smarter, will get the attention. I mean, it's just, it's just like that. Dad loves his son to, to do things that he did. He loves him. The other boy who is just, he wants to work in the garden, he wants to do the, he's not daddy's boy because dad, dad likes the guy who can do sports better and who likes fast cars maybe and who can build things. That should not be. It should be, your kids should be treated equally and we should treat the other kids the same way that your brother or your sister is is a little slow in this and that, you guys should help her. That's what we should teach the ones that are ahead. Show them that your brother and sister need your help. And when you go out or you're riding your bikes, give them turns on their bike. And don't, uh, in front of their friends, don't shun them. Bring them into the group. That's what we ought to be. That's parenting, properly. Pastor? I think the tendency still exists today with, uh, when, when the families have more than, than two, three, four, yes. five kids. And, and the tendency is uh, either to, if I remember a certain family, they, they have uh, six sons and a girl, the last one. Right. right? So, so the favorite was the girl, yes, right. of course. Yeah. But uh, in many cases, the, the last or the youngest uh, kid, yes. either boy or, or girl, it, it tends to be the, the favorite. Right or, or the spoiled one. Yes, yes. The, uh, and and I I, I want to say that uh, if that happens, yeah, we as parents have to uh, make sure that we love them equally. That's right. All. Yes, yes. Because then we're gonna be in trouble. Exactly. Yeah. Sooner or later they're gonna come up with mm. something and say, ah, oh, yeah. I remember that. So so we have to be very very careful. Yeah. And, and teach. To the younger generation. Exactly. Teach yeah. it to the younger generation. In the family. In the family. In the family. And show them, yeah. Your, your brother or your sister is just different. They, know, they don't have, you know, uh, don't, uh, don't point out things that they, they, I mean, silly things that they can do. But just tell them they're they, they different, you know. Your brother or your sister need help and please help them at school. And I've seen it at school. I mean, I taught for like 23 years and I know. And... Yeah, last day, a couple of years ago, I was teaching at HA, and you can see the kids that need help. And then when there's brother and sister in the room, I've noticed how they help each other. Mm -hmm. They help each other, you know, uh, and they, they watch out if the other kids want to say derogatory remarks, then they will tell them, hey, why are you saying that? They, they kind of stand and cover for that one. That's great. That's what that's, they get it at home, probably. The mother's saying, hey, watch out for Johnny, okay? this and that and that. That's how it should be. But back, we, don't, be like, don't be like Jacob. Jacob was, he made him a cloak of many colors. He immediately showed the whole world, this is my favorite. That's what he did. And his brothers were saying, hey, there comes the dreamer. Look, dad's favorite. Why should he? And then he came back and said, I had a dream that at 12 uh, <laughs> was bending to me. You mean we bowed to you? He said, that's what I dreamed. And, 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 it, and the dad accepted it. Yeah, yeah. So we have to be very careful with that. That's, uh, that's something we have to be careful. Okay, so now, uh, 
when, when faith, uh, we, we got to move on to the next one because our, our time is going. <clears throat> Preparing for old age. Preparing for old age. <laughs> yeah, how, how do you do that? How, how do you pre prepare for old, old age? <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, we know old, when, when does old age come? How many years do we have on this earth? The Bible said, tells us, right? Proverbs 90 verse 10 tells us. 70, three score years and ten. After that, it's grace time. You have grace. grace. It's a bonus. What That's a bonus. So when does old age start? Well, it, I, I don't know when it starts, but I know you old when you get to it. <laughs> no, well, you, 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 you're there. <laughs> yeah. You're coming, you're coming close, you're coming close to 70. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, friend. <laughs> well, hey. I'll see you in the old folks home with the rocket <laughs> I didn't say that. Oh, well, yes, they were. Well, well, age starts when you join the, the church choir. Well, okay, okay. That's also something. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Uh, our time is brief. And you can think, when, when those people lived in the time of uh, Jesus and beyond, I mean, let's go to, the, to way back when when Noah and these people lived. Yeah. Noah was 600 years old when he built the ark. Yeah. I mean, Methuselah lived almost a thousand years. Yeah. I, I mean, so these people, Adam lived to, to, to 930. Yeah. So they didn't prepare for that. Man. Because he was way. Yeah. He, yeah. Was way he was way there. Yeah. When, when they, these people were four, five hundred years old, they were young men. Yeah. When they were four, they were young. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But now look how sin has, has cut us down. Sin cut us down. Now here we are. And, and I mean, God knew it was going to happen because the, this was written way before our time. It was already said three score years and ten. And that, that's it for you. And if you are lucky to live beyond that, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because everything, I know because it's, things are shutting down. My one ear, I can hear from here. And yeah, then it's a pain here, then your knees, then your ears. If it's always something going wrong, or your eyes, you have to check and, and, and you have your glasses strengthened and all that stuff. But you're getting older. That comes with old age. But how can you prepare for old age? Why is it important to recognize the brevity of life? Uh, that we have on this planet. Why is it important to recognize that? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's true, that's true. So that we can grow into old age gracefully and peacefully. So we don't have to say, hey, suddenly I'm old. You wake up one morning and look in the mirror. Wow, man, I didn't know, look at this. My, and gravity is not kind to old people. <laughs> <laughs> Israel, yeah. and you say Moses was 500 years old, if you look at Israel, it's not a flat land. It's no. very hilly and it's very rocky. It's, so yeah. I, I, I said to myself, how in the world did Moses make it across this, this desert like this, you know, in his old age? Yeah. Well, the thing is, it, as we get older, Yeah, you. Okay, everything was good. And and you can, but it, it, now that is why preparation is necessary. You cannot prepare when you are already there. The word preparation by itself means something that you must do before. So when you are young or relatively young, then you start looking at yourself. You know, eating habits. What your eating habits? What what your uh, uh, you're exercising, make sure you do those kinds of things, you know, because when you're facing old age, there are lots of things happen. You fear, there's lots of fears that happen. It says, uh, now, in Psalm 71, uh, Psalm 71 spells it out really nicely. So if you go to Psalm 71, and we, we're coming to, towards the end now, Psalm 71 is the, is the psalm that... Um, that, that talks about, that teaches a lot about uh, old age. And uh, the person, the author of Psalm 71, I don't know who that is, but it's, it's, I don't think it was uh, David. I don't think it was him. Excuse me. Yeah. 
But I'm, yeah. yeah. Because of his lifestyle. Yes. He spent his time with him. He was a warrior. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He and all his warfare. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so that, so okay, that, that doesn't have anything to do with the, the chapter seventy one. It's just coincidental. Yeah, but but uh, we don't know right, and uh, you know there were other writers also for the, of the Psalms. So, but here we can see in this Psalm seventy one, it teaches a, a lot about preparing for old age, but it also talks about life in general. Uh, and the 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 best way, as you read this Psalm seventy one, the best way to grow old is to put your trust in God. That's how, that's how you do it. When you get older, you cannot depend on your wife, you cannot depend on your children, you cannot... You, I mean, they're there to help. But you as a person, your trust has to be in Christ, in God. In God. That's where it comes from, right? So, uh, uh, and, and, and the person, the author of, of Psalm 71, shares three important lessons that he learned as he moved toward the season, this, this season, old age, in, in his life. And uh, one of the things that he mentions in, in, uh, in uh, 71, develop a deep personal knowledge of God. That's the first thing we can do as we prepare. Develop a deep knowledge of God. We see that in verse 17. We, you, be sure you know that uh, who your refuge is, who your savior is. Verse 1 and 2. He is our rock and our fortress in verse 3 and so forth. If you read the 71 when you have time, it's an excellent psalm. And you can see how to order your life. The second thing he talks about is develop good habits as you prepare for old age. Don't stop exercising. Don't, uh, don't stop eating good food, nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, rest. All these things have to be done, you know. And then uh, verse 3 says, and verse 6 to 14, and 14 says, Trust and praise and hope in God. Then the third thing that uh, in, in, in Psalm 71 uh, that he shares is another lesson is develop a passion for God's mission. So what do you think that means? Develop a passion for God's mission? Be idle, still in your old age, you should be yes. active in doing God's work. Yes, you know what the mission is. Spreading the gospel. Don't think that because you're old that you're exempt. You're not exempt. No one is exempt. I've seen people in wheelchairs doing God's work. You, know, you, you cannot say, oh, but I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a paraplegic or I'm this or that. If you can get out and if people who attend to you, you can attend to them. Take the message to them, right? It's a, yeah, you can, um, you can uh, what, what did we say? Don't be idle. Even in retirement, keep praising God. And telling others about him. You know, the people who care for you, they are the ones that, that should know about Christ. You can't say, I don't have anybody I see. I mean, uh, I'm uh, 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 in bed all day. I have a nurse coming in. I've, well, those are the people that you can talk to. You can witness to them, right? You can. All right. So, uh, what about the, the last part now? Let's rose up. Preparing for death. So we've gone through the whole lesson, actually. <laughs> so uh, preparing for death. Oh, boy. And how do we do this? How do you prepare for death? And I don't mean prepare and make sure your coffin is there, going to be there, and you know where you're going to be buried, what cemetery you'd like to be in. I don't mean that kind of preparation. How do you prepare for, the, for, for when your time comes, your last day on this earth. Right? So, so well, let's, 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 the first thing. <laughs> okay, Pastor. Well, I, I, I guess uh, we, we haven't been there. Yes. So, uh, we can say we should do this, mm -hmm. but when things are close, then we probably got to change our mind. Yeah. So, uh, 
this is something that uh, sometimes comes, uh, we, we can predict it. I mean, we know that we're going to, to die in the next six months. Yes. Or it, it comes suddenly. Yes. In, in a, when, when the lesson talks about preparation for death, is that, uh, first of all, we have to be prepared spiritually. Yes. Because death in this earth is not the last thing. Yes. It's not the end. It's the end on this earth. But there, we, we have a, a, an eternal life with, with, with God. Um, so and the second thing is uh, probably we can make some uh, arrange, arrangements yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for when it happens, uh, at least uh, we, that, don't, we that, don't leave the burden on, on the family. That's true. But uh, most importantly, uh, I would say spiritually and mentally. All right. And I have a sister who was diagnosed with ALS yeah. last year. Yes. And it's just a matter of time. It yeah. could be a year, it could be six years. But my sister is prepared for that. Her faith is very strong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an unbelievable. She's, I think, four years younger than I am. So and she has She's six four children. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. So I mean, we're not talk like we say the emphasis here is not on uh, like you have your burial plot, you have a certificate or things like that. That's important that you have to prepare as, as well. But I think it's like emphasis that uh, you say, because in 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us about death. We have to, we have to be at peace with God. As we, as we get towards uh, getting older, and some of us are infirm and we are sick. We know we're going to die. So we, we have to get our house in order. You know, don't wait and put it off. And I've seen people that were pleasant. They were sick, but they were pleasant. They knew their maker. And I've seen it now, we've seen it with our brother, uh, uh, what is his name that died, the Pathfinder guy? Uh, Abner. Abner. Yeah, there he, and and I, I saw a couple of other uh, messages where men and women walked up and they had a service for them before they died even. It was like a obituary but they were still alive because that's how they felt. They felt at ease. They felt they know their maker. So they're not worried about this. They made sure that they are right with everyone and they're living close to God because they know they're going to die. That kind of preparation you have to make. I remember a, a very close friend. Um, she, she, uh, she got seriously ill in um, I went to visit her mm. uh, before she died yeah. uh, with my newly wife, mm -hmm. and um, it was shocking for me mm. because she was very skinny, uh, losing skin and bones. yeah mm. skin and bones. So um, I, I tried to not to uh, look myself uh, so shocked mm. in front of her, but I, I don't know if I was able to do it. Yeah, the yeah. thing is. Um, after after uh, uh, some time that I was there, I said, "Okay, uh, her name was uh, Miriam." I said, hey, "Should we pray for for you so so God can put your hand His hand on you?" He said, "You know what? No." Mm. Said, Why? Said, well, I I had a long conversation with that, and I confessed all my sins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready, so He can take me anytime. Mm. I know that I am going to die, <coughs> and, and I'm ready, I'm ready, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I know if I die today or a month from now, I'm going to be resurrected, the first resurrection. So um, I, 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 I stood speechless, because what, what else am I going to say? Mm. Yeah. So, so then I said, okay, let's, let's still pray. That's so, okay, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God's grace with you <laughs> yeah, yeah. until the last day. To keep, yeah. Yeah, so um, I don't know if, if, if we're going to have that strength mm. to accept that we're going to that. She was in the late 30s, not even 40. Mm. Mm. It, um, so it, it was devastating for the entire family. She had three children. I guess the oldest were like 11 or something. Yeah. Like that. Mm. But. Um, uh, I, I think this this is something that uh, it is hard to talk sometimes, and uh, like I said earlier, uh, we're not there. So, and when things change, mm. 
and we receive the, the bad news, then, then it, it seems that we change our mind. Mm -hmm. it, 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 we were not that strong as we thought. Right. But uh, we, we have to pray about it and, yeah. and be prepared. And for, be sure. prepared. for sure, yeah. yeah. And when that happens, you? It is hard. You, you see death in your face, you know, yeah. then you know what it is. Yeah. It's hard for me really sometimes to say things to my sister because I'm not sure what to say. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's, be, it's between them and God, but you can just encourage them to have faith in Him and pray for Him. Like I said, but it's a nice thing when you, pre, when you are prepared. Mm. When, when you think it, it's more important for me to have God's approval, more important for me than anything else. You've, I've taken care of all that, or you know your family's taking care of the physical things when the time comes, but you're yourself. So you can, you can like, like they said, die in peace. And I've seen people on their last, read their last, but they have a smile on their face. They, they're not fighting it. They're not fighting it. It's almost like they see, yes, Lord, I'm ready. Take, you can take me now. Yeah. yeah, you see, they are at peace and we cannot read their hearts. And we never should do that because we don't know what's going on in their heart. God can save them right at that 11th hour, just before they breathe the last. They can, like the thief on the cross, he just, uh, he, he just said to him, uh, will you remember me? And, and, and Jesus said, yes, I will. So we, we cannot judge. To the people looking on to them, those crooks, they, they will die like, you know, whatever. But in Jesus, this one, yeah, he won't die like that. This one, he'll die now, but he will be with me in paradise. So, so, so death is not an easy thing to stay a fa a face, you know, but we need to be ready when it comes. Now, the last text we have to read is in 1 Kings chapter 2. That's the last text. And this is the last word that King David, on his deathbed, gave to his son Solomon. And what were those words he told Solomon? 1 Kings, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, right down here. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. What did he say? Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, yes. I am going the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of Jehovah thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commands, and his ordinances and his testimonies, according to that which is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself, that Jehovah may establish his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, yes. to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, uh -huh. said he, a man on the throne of Israel. The king said, Be obedient to God's law. You're going to take over from me as king. Be obedient to God's law and be a strong and courageous king. And then I like those last three words. Be a strong and courageous, word, uh, a courageous king for the people. No, be courageous and strong for the Lord. You know, and I'm thinking of all the services that we do in our church. And in the mornings when we pray, you know, Tom and I, we pray for the whole church around every Sabbath morning. And we always ask God to help in the different rooms where things take place or even on the platform. We start at the platform, then we pray there. The sermon comes from there. The singing comes from there. We go up there to make announcements. And we ask God to bless and be with those who make appearances on the platform. So it may not be their words. And, you know, it's always things we do for God. When we're up there, when we're singing, it, sometimes we sing for the people, you know? And, it, and we, it, it's not really, because God is the audience. We perform for Him. It's just that the people are there, but we are in church for God. And we do it unto Him. But sometimes we forget and we let that enter into our service. We do it for people, what people think. Will they clap, will they not clap if I'm done singing? 
But God is clapping in heaven because God is, loves what you're doing. You're doing it for Him. And that's what we pray about and say, Lord, let everyone who take part in the service have that mentality today. They're serving you, they're serving you, they're serving you. Not people. You, 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 you. You get the glory, not them. They may clap their hands when we are doing something good, but, but it's for you. So, so, and, and so when he said that to his son, be a strong and courageous king for the Lord. Say, so you're going to be a king for the Lord, man. Not for the people. Yeah, you're going to govern the people. But when you do a good job, it's for God. It's for God. It's for God. So be faithful and trust in the Lord always. That's the message. That's the message for this lesson. You know, make sure that God gets the glory in everything we do. Everything we do. It's for Him. And the people will get the benefit. If we do it for Him, He'll make sure that the people will get the blessing. He'll bless the people through us. Isn't that true? Right. Any other comments? The only constant thing in this life is change. Yes. There's always changes. Yes. So we just make sure that with every change we're in, that we're faithful to God. Yes. Because that's the only way we could survive and we could live a fulfilling life. Exactly right. That's only when He is with us. Yes, that's true. So, okay. So this lesson... It was good for us to show us how to prepare. It's not just haphazard. Everything we do for God, we must put some effort into it. He's not just going to plonk the blessings on us. We must do our part. Then He will bless. Right? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your wonderful Word that teaches us so much. Lord, we know that You have the, the interest on, at heart for us. You want us to be saved. That is why you're giving us all these things that we can prepare and be ready and that we can know how much you love us. You want us in the kingdom. That is why you're so good and so kind to give us these wonderful things in your word. Help that we may try to live them out. It's not always easy, Father, but we know with you and the Holy Spirit and your Son Jesus, we can do it. We can be victorious because you were victorious. So bless us as we go from here, as we study this lesson now, for this week coming, that we will be ready to have a good discussion next week and talk about the goodness of God, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.